Our learning outcomes today include, first, participants will learn how legislative requirements of the Florida Post-Secondary Comprehensive Transition Program Act are met by the Florida Center for Students with Unique Abilities. Also, participants will gain knowledge about Florida Post-Secondary Comprehensive Transition Programs and Student Outcomes and Florida Center for Students with Unique Abilities Activities from July 1, 2022 through June 30th, 2023. This is our first time having a webinar that focuses on our annual report, but our teams spend quite a bit of time gathering information and sharing that information on their program, as well as all of the students in their programs. And we spend a lot of time compiling that and putting it together in a report. And that report, whenever you um, receive a copy of the webinar can be accessed by the QR code on the front of the PowerPoint on the first slide or the PDF, um, not the PDF, but a link to that has also been placed in the chat, which will take you directly to our annual report, which is available on our website. There's actually an archive of all of our annual reports. And um, just to, to share with you, I wanted to let you know that there are lots of times that we receive questions from folks about Florida post-secondary comprehensive transition programs. And most time, what we do is we refer people to the annual report because that information is there. It has information on all of the Florida post-secondary comprehensive transition programs. And it doesn't specifically identify any student by name, but it has information on all of our students as well. Along with that, it's got all of the things that we've been doing. And that's what we're gonna be talking about here in the next little while during this webinar. So to start out, as always, for anyone that might be new joining us, the Florida Post-Secondary Comprehensive Transition Program Act was passed in 2016, and it had those four major components. It developed programs. It developed the Florida Center for Students with Unique Abilities. And then it also provided two funding elements, funding to establish programs and funding for student scholarships. It also has requirements for Florida post-secondary comprehensive transition programs. If you have not read the legislation, if you just simply, you can Google Florida post-secondary comprehensive transition program act and our Florida legislation will come up. It's very well written and under accountability You'll see their information about the center, and it talks about us working in collaboration with the Board of Governors, us working in collaboration with the State Board of Education to approve programs. And if you've been involved in that process, you're familiar with that, with programs being approved. It also has a list of other reporting requirements. We oftentimes tell folks, because the reporting is pretty extensive, that what we're doing is we're trying to, in um, with, with integrity and with quality, to capture all of the requirements of the legislation and the reporting information that programs are providing to us. So at this time, Janice is going to talk to you about program information. Thank you, Drew. And like Drew said, we have a lot of information that our Florida Post-Secondary Comprehensive Transition Programs actually submit. And we're, we're, we're trying to capture some of the highlights in this presentation. And I, I think you um, will appreciate that some of the work that our team members actually do. If you're not familiar with the approved programs, this is a, a snapshot of what the legislation has identified as some of the institutional requirements that house our Florida post-secondary comprehensive transition programs. They all must provide meaningful credentials, preferably credentials that can be industry certification. Not all of them are, but it is preferred because that gives students who participate in these programs an additional opportunity, competitive opportunity to become employed. 
the programs are all focused on employment as the outcome. So when you have um, meaningful credentials, meaning they have some kind of importance to the employers in the field, and that has industry certifications that are known nationwide as well as statewide, their, the focus on employment will be, more, will be greater for our students. All of our programs must be in an inclusive context. That means that our students um, or these programs do not serve only students with intellectual disabilities. As they look at um, serving the students, they serve only those students, but they cannot be in a context where they're segregated the entire program. So part of their uh, credit, uh, curriculum must be in inclusive settings and our programs are designed that way. Students must also participate no less than half time. And actually most of our students are full-time students in our programs. We have a few exceptions and our programs are prepared to work with those that are that need to attend half time, even if they do have half time programs, but they cannot attend less than half time. Similar to any other student attending a college, that student has to maintain um, satisfactory academic progress. And this is the same for our students. So our programs must establish what that definition is. And for the most part, our programs use the definitions of the institutions in which they are housed. They also have components within their definition that provides support above and beyond that may be for typical students in those programs. And as our programs um, work toward their application and admitting students, they must become a federally approved program. They must become a comprehensive transition and post-secondary program, which means those that makes those programs eligible for Pell Grants and for student work study. So the students can have additional benefits beyond what um, is already included in the act. So those that's what the programs must do at eligible institutions. And so who are those eligible institutions? Right now we have over 120 eligible institutions at the state university level, at the college level, and at the technical college level. That includes independent colleges and universities, as long as they're not for profit and accredited. So across our state, we have a number of institutions who are currently eligible to become a Florida post-secondary comprehensive transition program. And in this last year, prior to this annual report, we've seen a boom in 2023. So we look forward to our next year's report. At the time of this report, this is a breakdown of where our approved programs are. As you can see, we have 11 technical colleges and seven each at the university level and at the state college level. That was prior to October 1st, and we have grown since then. Again, prior to October 1st, we had 25 programs. We now have 20. Eight, we've added um, another state college, Miami Dade College, and we've added Travis Technical College and Ridge Technical College. And so we have 25 programs. We have them on 34 campuses, and we actually have another uh, institution who's preparing to move to another campus. So we'll have 35 campuses. And we have actually about four more institutions right now in queue that will put us over 30 institutions before this, um, this year's report is done. When we look at some of the information that our programs provide, they share information about their enrollment. You can see where we started with in 2016, 2017, uh, across a few programs with 48 students during our reporting year. Look at our numbers now. Over the seven years, now this month will be eight, over the seven years that we've had our programs, we have served over a thousand students have been admitted into our programs at our various institutions 
Last year, we had 274 students enrolled across institutions. And so you can see the numbers range based on each institution's capability and where they are right now. So we always get a report on what the student enrollment is. With those students, again, you remember that a requirement for an FPCTP was that they are the programs are inclusive contexts. Well, look at our students' enrollment in inclusive courses. During the 22-23 academic year reporting year, there were 256 inclusive courses across our programs that were offered. And so our numbers are continuing to grow where programs are being more integrated within the institutions and working with uh, staff and faculty across each institution, more inclusive courses are being provided to our students and we're super excited about that. And again, you can see the number grows each year. Now this slide is pretty uh, um, interesting because what we wanna share is the typical type of roles that programs have running it. Um, you can see there are roles that are um, critical to any program at an institution um, that needs support to be led. They have leadership at various levels, um, but when we start thinking about their staff roles, we may call them staff directors or program directors. They have advising units. The advising units include unique people who are designed to work specifically with the Florida Post-Secondary Comprehensive Transition Programs. And we have the advising staff, some of the time from the advising staff that we'll see on another row in another screen um, where some of the advising staff FTE is used to actually support our programs. But these are some of the typical roles. Um, thinking about some of our programs have residential components. So we need res residential staff to cover them as well as others. But um, these are some of the more typical types of roles that our staff cover, our programs covers for staff roles. We like showing this because a lot of institutions who are not on board think about if we're going to provide a program for students with intellectual disabilities at our institution, that would be a burden on our institution. And we're just showing you a snapshot of some of the differences. We wanted to show you an example of a state college, of a university, and of a technical college, how they vary differently in the way that they have staff, the number of staff, and at the FTE that is needed to run a program. When you look at this particular um, slide, you see in the far right-hand corner, you see what the FTE is that is needed per, for each student to actually run it. Some institutions prior to getting started would think that we need 10 FTEs, 10 full-time equivalent personnel to run a program like this. But that's not it. When we have programs in an inclusive environment, we do have staff that are specifically hired to run it, but our institutions also, also share um, that responsibility along with some of the existing staff and our personnel. It all depends on the number of students that you have and then for each staff member, the number of hours that they work. You see Broward College, as you look at an average of 0.15 FTE. I think an institution would be surprised that it's so little when you think about the spread of time uh, with the number of students that they actually have compared to Southeastern, who set up a little differently is 0.14 FTE. As you look at it with Southeastern, you have at least one person who is part-time and each institution will be different. Now, when you look at Orange Technical College, this is Again, very different for each institution. Only two staff members then, that's a heavier load. As they look at building and expanding their program, which they'll be doing during this year, uh, their FTE was a little different. Their staff are with their students are quite a bit of the time, whereas you see with the other ones, that is not necessarily the case. So as they uh, facilitate growth 
and develop their curriculum and work with integration throughout their institution, every year it changes. It is next year to be a totally different number. Um, and so we like showing this just to be a, a way of informing each institution will be very different with the number of staff, how they house the staff and the number of students in which they support at one given time. So next we're gonna talk about student information. And for those of you who, for, who provide the information, you know the first step is providing your program information each year and then providing your student information. So when we talk about students, for anyone that is not aware, eligible students must be a student with an intellectual disability, as that term is defined in federal legislation. They must have documentation regarding that disability, and they must physically attend the eligible institution no less than half time. Those are the three most important things to remember about students. So let's look at gender and the percentage. We have a few more males than females, but pretty much we're pretty close to a 50-50 there among the students. When we look at race, we see that there are more white students participating, but we gather information on other students also and encourage programs to look at how we make sure that we're reaching out to all students with intellectual disabilities. And with ethnicity, um, we see that 26% of students last year identified as Hispanic Latino. Living arrangements while attending the FPCTP. Most of students, 82%, lived with parents, siblings, or extended family members. 12% were in housing associated with the institution of higher education. 6% lived either alone or on their own with a spouse, domestic partner, or roommates, or in supervised living. Drew, yes. on this one, we really like showing this one because over time, uh, we know that when we share information like this, several of our programs Maybe they didn't start off thinking about a residential component. They think about independent living as being a key factor in helping adults with intellectual disability transition into um, our community and expand, particularly after they receive, after they become employed themselves. When you have 18% of that population growing in some direction or another, where they're living either on campus or independently, um, we like seeing that number grow. And so this is one that kind of help institutions as they come aboard to think about the residential component and how that helps with independent living opportunities. So we're, we're happy to, to report on that. Yes, absolutely. So here's a snapshot of several um, elements of student data. So as Janice mentioned earlier, we had 274 students enrolled in Florida post-secondary comprehensive transition programs. 89% of those students maintained satisfactory academic progress. We had a retention rate of 86%. And usually that difference is because students move. 60% um, of students who gained work experience in competitive, supported, or unpaid and other settings, different types of work. We had 68 students that completed this year and 272 was the number of students who have completed an FPCTP since, 200, since 2017. So, Drexler has done a really great job of developing some graphics for us to just sort of represent some things that that we think that we find interesting. We hope that you find them interesting too, because these are all in the annual report. And again, I will encourage you to download it and um, and to look through it because it is very interesting 
Um, but the top five career clusters prior to FPCTP enrollment. And we know that we do a lot of person-centered planning, looking at what do students want to do? What type of career are they going to choose? So we see there a lot of students choose hospitality and tourism. Well, that's, that's really good because in Florida, there are lots of careers in hospitality and tourism, followed by arts, AV technology and communication, then agriculture, food and natural resources, which is also a very large employment field in Florida, education and training. And you know, all of these fields are growing and the need for em skilled employees in all of these fields are critical. And then um, <clears throat> number five was business management and administration. And as we go through, we also look during the FPCTP, what were students involved in? And you see that it very closely follows there with the number of students that were involved in those fields seeking credentials that specifically align with those career pathways. I think an important part of that is, like you mentioned before, Drew, what our teams do, our, our our programs spend a lot of time hearing what students have to say and identifying the programs that meets their preferences, meet their needs and meet their interests. So while they express what they want to do prior to coming in, as they, as any student, think about and get exposed to higher education, some of that shifts a little bit but our, our teams work really hard to make sure that they are aligning and identifying the right curriculum so that those students can be successful, um, successfully employed upon exit of that program. And so here's some of that information on students. And you see that some of this information is the same that we've shared before on students enrolled, satisfactory academic progress, retention rate, completers, work experience, but the top five employment career clusters for students, we see that marketing, sales, and service moves to the number one spot here. 28 students, 23 in hospitality and tourism, 16 in agriculture, food, and natural resources, 10 in education and training, and six in human resources. Human services, sorry about that. There we go. So to talk a little bit about the courses that students took that will lead to those career, there were 1,518 courses that students were enrolled in. 954 of those courses were inclusive courses because we're always looking at making sure that programs have inclusive courses where students are learning and interacting with their peers. Over time, if you look at the total number of students completing an FPCTP, one thing here, and I'm sure that this has crossed your mind as you look at this, that you know we went through a pandemic during these years, and still, because of your many of your you who were at Florida Post Secondary Comprehensive Transition Programs, who continued to provide services to students, the number of students completing continued to rise. And you can see that's a really, that's a pretty steep curve there. So um, I think you should pat yourself on the back if you're at a Florida post-secondary comprehensive transition program. And then this is the number of completers employed. And this is from our follow-up survey. One of the requirements is that programs follow students for five years after exiting the program. And part of that, and that information is to find out where the student's working, how many hours they're working, um, what, 
wage range they are working in and if they have benefits. But as we look here, the number of students, the number of completers that are employed has continued to rise also, certainly the direction that we want it to continue. It'll be nice to see whenever we've whenever we have 10 years of data, just to see how far we've come in 10 years. So we hope that this puts a smile on your face as it did to, to us here at the center, when we really look at where completers are employed. Who are the employers that are employing our students when they, um, when they complete Florida post-secondary comprehensive transition programs. We have folks who are employed with Florida State University, Universal Studios, Burlington Coat Factory, Orlando Health, Mary Kay, FNC Design Studio, Littlewood Elementary, Home Depot, Florida Geological Survey, and Disney Springs. So we also want to talk a little bit about our work at the Florida Center for Students with Unique Abilities and share with you about our outreach that we've done to share our information with our existing programs, with those programs in the development stages, and those programs that have not yet decided to develop a program. This past year, we had seven news briefs. We had nine webinars. We presented at 28, we had 28 conference presentations. At some of those, we may have had two presentations. And we also, at our Florida Post-Secondary Education Program Planning Institute, we had 37 teams participate. So that was all of our current Florida Post-Secondary Comprehensive Transition Programs, as well as many more who are interested in finding out more. And as you all know, sometimes the development stage takes time for folks to pull a team together, to be able to share the information throughout the um, leadership at their institution and move forward. But we had 37 teams participate. Drew, before you go on, I do, and you can, you can pause at this, this screen, either one, it's okay. Um, we will talk about, um, Drew, elaborate a little bit more on outreach as you look in your handout further down, but I did want to make a correction in what I said with slide 25, when you look at twi slide 25 and slide 11, and you don't have to move the move it to that. 11 had students in um, inclusive courses. That was 254 students out of our 274 students who are actually enrolled in inclusive courses or were enrolled in inclusive courses throughout the year. That's 92% of our students who are, you can see very much involved in this. So I do wanna make that correction. When you look at slide 25 and slide 11, one is about the number of students in inclusive courses. And then slide 25 shows you um, actually the number of inclusive courses across all of our programs in which students were enrolled. So student numbers versus number of inclusive courses. And again, outreach will be talked about a little further as well. As we look at the credentials that our students earn, they may have earned these credentials at any point during their program. Um, not only do completers have earned uh, the credentials, but students throughout the program. So we do want to put that up front. And what we'll share is an example. Again, you have the link, the QR code to get to our annual report. And this is found in our appendices. And we just want, just for emphasis sake, to be able to share some of the, the differences about how we present this information and how important it is as we think about our FPCTPs and the, the way they strategically look at what their program offerings are, and then thinking about the unique interests, preferences, and skills of the students in their programs, and how many were in those programs during this reporting year. 
we have well over 300 credentials. Our annual report does not show that in this table, although it's mentioned in the, con in the content of the annual report, but it's not in the appendices. This only represents those students who were actually enrolled during this reporting year. Our programs define what we call a general endorsement. And a general endorsement is something that an institution may establish themselves that like we call as a local credential to recognize that those students have participated in an FPCTP. Oftentimes those general endorsements are the same credential that any other student will get who enters that institution. We see that most often in our technical colleges. But our, our FPCTPs may have created a general endorsement. With that general endorsement, they may have also attached micro-credentials and other credentials related to them, rather or not those credentials are industry certification. So an example that you see with this, uh, the College of the Florida Keys, they have a general credential that they've created for every student that enters project access. However, students earn above and beyond that general credential, as you will see in the examples of this slide and the next. When we start looking at under credentials, general services specialists, um, what do they get? They can get a general services specialist college credit certificate. That's pretty important. This isn't something that is uniquely made up for our students. It is what any student at the College of Florida Keys will earn. Look at the certifications, American Hotel and Lodging Association, Certified Front Desk Representative, American Hotel and Lodging Association, and Certified Guest Room. This isn't just for Florida, this is America. And so when we start thinking about those industry certifications, which you see a description in the middle, and then you see, are these credentials industry recognized? or not, and you have in this case, yes, and how many students were enrolled in that particular concentration. And so again, it is not all of the credentials that are offered, but it's those in which the students were enrolled. What's on the next slide, Drew? I'll also say that this is one of the appendices that we probably share the most with new programs who are just trying to figure out what do you mean by credentials? And when we share with them the different types of credentials that are offered, we oftentimes share this appendix with them. And this is a continuation of the College of Florida Keys. Um, again, looking at descriptions of some of the other um, credentials that didn't show up, guest services professional, serve safe and food manager all under that one area. And again, the descriptions for it. As we look at a university, Florida International University, they too have created a general endorsement uniquely for the students that are in um, FIU Education Embrace program. All of the students who participate in this program will exit with this above and beyond the other credentials you have listed here. Health and nutrition, um, which they get a certification as a certified personal trainer. They also created micro-credentials to give them another advantage when they're going out into the workforce um, where they get basics of, of nutrition, a badge and basics of nutrition. Again, you can see that health and nutrition is industry certified. They had five students. Other areas, fundamentals of food, hospitality, Again, we'll see in examples where um, those are industry recognized as well and a number of students in that program all defined. Some of the um, credentials are, um, the, de the definitions are from um, national credential language. It may be from our state credential language. Um, so when we look at those certifications, those are areas that um, I think are pretty important as New institutions think about it and see some of the things that our programs offer. Technology is another area. So again, they will vary by each institution, but we really love, like Drew said, sharing with everybody how the institutions think about the options that they want to make available for their students. And you know what? 
they don't always start off with all of these. They start off with some and they grow as they work with staff and personnel across the institution and as they learn about students' interests and them trying to increase their enrollment to bring more students in. We also yeah. find that a lot of families really like this appendix also. When we're at family conferences, just for families to know what students are learning in the programs and what skills they will have whenever they, they exit. And you know, what's important about this is, this is the kind of information that any student and family would look for when they're thinking about which institution to choose. We want our students um, across Florida with intellectual disabilities to have that knowledge too, that there isn't one program um, that is that funnels everybody, that we funnel everyone into. There are a number of options for these Floridians, just like they are for other students. And so we're really proud of what our institutions offer. This is an example of a technical college. And you'll see this endorsement, the Occupational Completion Certificate, is the same credential that I was saying earlier that other students at this technical college also receive. So when students enter the Lee County Technical Colleges, they will receive the same credentials any other student was, will receive. There's no local credential that has been created, and that will vary across technical colleges, which is fine. Um, look at the credential areas. We have a lot of our technical programs that use the specialized career instruction credential. However, they also use other options, the CTE options, as you see, in this case, automotive collision technology service and the certifications that accompany it. As you see with the design, digital design, it is not an industry recognized credential. However, it has students in it. And it certainly is a program that students are interested in as well as employers are interested in students gaining skills. So let's go to the next one. When we look at Adobe Photoshop, um, lots of us wish we could, that's a huge program, but students are learning those skills. And we find that across several of our, te our technical colleges, as well as state colleges that have CTE, they're making that offer. So it makes it a good challenge as families and students look across the state and think about who's going to meet their needs. Just like, again, any typical student look at who's going to meet our needs, how long will it take for me to get through it, and I'm thinking about the employment that they would like to do electronic technology. Look at all the certifications beneath that. I mean, it just goes on with this being an industry recognized um, area. You have many options. That means that as the student progresses through the program, they have support and opportunities to gain these certifications. And when they go out to employers um, seeking a job, they have all of those backed up on their resume um, to say, look, I've done this, or in our portfolio, which is a common um, repository that our students use um, to say, this is, this is what I've done, this is what I'm capable of, um, I'm prepared to go to work. Okay. Is there another one? Okay. And so that's the credential. So we start thinking about our grants and our scholarships. And Drew, is this mine or is this yours? And, you know, so I can be quiet. It's, it's still you. Okay. <laughs> it's still me. So when we start looking at the support that Drew mentioned before, in our annual report, we have to report how many grants were issued, looking at the amount, how many scholarships were issued, looking at the amounts. And so in our next slide, you'll see that during the 22, um, 23 um, year, reporting year, we awarded $16 million for program um, implementation. Some of our programs were just getting started. Some were in their third year of a grant. So this expands from brand new programs to programs that have been around with us since 2016. And keeping in mind that our grants, they are continuous. So our programs start off with initial grants for three years. And then at the end of those three years, they can they submit a proposal 
for three more years. That continues for program implementation to support and help su sustain those programs at those institutions. Those institutions also have their other, uh, their own support. Again, just like any other program, they have foundations, um, they have other ways in which they raise support and keeping in mind that our students also um, get support in scholarships. They can get Pell grants. They can also do student work study. But we issued $1.8 million in scholarships to the students who attended last year. And we're looking at that number to grow and it has already surpassed that number for this year. So we're excited about um, the support that the legislators have provided to support students and to support institutions in the implementation. Our programs provide the information that help us realize what that legislation is. And each year, based on our institution's feedback, we share with our um, legislators what's working, what's not working, and how they can help us do better. And they certainly are listening. And, and our growth in number and support in dollars certainly is evident of that. Okay, next, I'm going to talk some about FCSUA outreach or a little more. I've already talked one slide earlier, but um, just for you to know, and this is something that we like to share because we certainly put a lot of effort. Um, our communications team does a great job with sharing on social media. So you see here over um, <clears throat> the first line is from 2122. The gold line is from 22, 23, but we increased with our Facebook followers, Twitter followers, Instagram followers, and those folks involved um, who have subscribed, who are subscribers to our YouTube channel. So if you aren't following us or you haven't subscribed, you should do so because we've got lots of great information that we share through social media. Our website, again, we're looking at 2021, the 21-22 year compared to 22-23. And we had many unique users that meant that that was, um, hmm, that they were, um, Janice, can you help me with that? I'm trying to think of what unique, unique users. And for some reason, that definition has, I think that that means that they went in and specifically chose a page that they were going to look at in our website. That's how they're identified as unique users. Um, new users, you see that number grew by almost 2,000. Returning users were down a little, but the sessions where people stayed on the website for a period of time greatly increased. And our social media crew can answer you about that unique users probably a lot better than I do, but I think you did a pretty good job and other people who know for Facebook. I'm, I'm thinking someone will probably write that definition in the yeah, chat. Yeah, Claudia, Claudia posted number of total users include new and returning, um, okay. she put, but for the unique users, um, I think you did a good job with that. Okay. And also, I'm sure you've probably heard us mention college the um, FCSUA College and Career Transition Clubs. And this has been us reaching out to the pipeline of students in Florida high schools that are going to be attending Florida post-secondary comprehensive transition programs. And so we provide funding to them. And when we look at students in um, college and career transition clubs, we want these programs to be inclusive. We don't want them to just be a club for students with intellectual disabilities. So 10% of students in those clubs are students with intellectual disabilities. 32% are students with disabilities other than intellectual disabilities. And 58% are students without disabilities. So we're looking at students in college and career transition clubs applying 
for college. And that certainly is the goal because all students involved in the College and Career Transition Club, learning about going to college, um, one of the student learning outcomes is for them to complete an application as well as for them to do an interest survey and also to visit a post-secondary institution. But when we um, look at over the years here, students with intellectual disabilities, um, we had 49 seniors in the club. Of that, 22 students who applied to college and 18 who were accepted. Students with other disabilities, there were 204 seniors, 51 of those students applied for college and 45 were accepted. And students without disabilities, there were 325. And from the data that we were able to gather, only 33 of those students applied to college and 31% 31 um, 31 students were, not 31%, but 31 students were accepted. So we try to look at all students to see, um, you know, are the clubs having the outcomes that we're, we're expecting? And we certainly, our goal is to make sure that students with intellectual disabilities are made aware of post-secondary opportunities and um, it certainly seems that it's working working there, but we're steadily working to improve that. Drew, in yes. addition to that, we want these clubs, these inclusive clubs to mirror what our FPCTPs are. And we wanna inform the public. This is another way, while this isn't a required area for our annual report, we like reporting it because it's a funnel to our FPCTPs and it helps inform the rest of the community that our programs exist and that our students have this in the pipeline for them as well as other students. And so we're excited about this. And um, as we work with high schools across the state, we, we get excited every time we see the number of students in the clubs and they must have them um, and the number of students without disabilities in the clubs who are also going to college. So we feel like we're impacting, as Drew said, all groups. Right. I'm gonna go ahead and share our contact information here because I'm going to, well, sorry about that. I'm, our contact information is there. Hopefully most of you have our email, but that's our phone number. And then we do encourage you to follow us on social media. And at this time, I'm gonna turn the recording off.